Dr. Campbell, I'm a student of your school. I've, I've, you, you've taught me so much throughout these years and I've, from other scholars that I've interviewed. The real fundamental question remains, if we have bogus, unfounded reserves on our books, those books being in the IMF, in the World Trade Organizations, everywhere around the world, Therefore, all the economists on Wall Street are only looking at published data, but yet published data is highly questionable, unaudited for the past 20, 30 years, as FC would say. Now, if $56 trillion economy of the world, particularly the West as, as the biggest consumer, is relying on cheap and abandoned oil, and they think there's plenty of it, where are we heading with this thing? No, I, I think you've uh, described it perfectly well in, in general. And I mean, we, we live in this financial world with stock markets and everything else built on imagery and postures and so on. And mindsets, you could say, built on the first half of the age of oil that has seen this expansion over the last century, so deeply embedded in the way people think. But the reality imposed by nature is we now enter the second half of the age of oil and see this uh, fundamental resource decline. And I mean, it, it is a turning point for mankind. The impact is going to be colossal. And who, who exactly knows what it will deliver? But I, I, myself, I, I would think that uh, the, uh, the world's population has to reduce largely in, in, in numbers because they simply don't have the energy to support the numbers they presently do in their present way of life. I mean, today, 29 billion barrels of oil a year support 6 billion people. But by 250, the supply is enough to support half that number in their present way of life. So the, the scale of the adjustment is just enormous. And a failure to adjust to this situation, frankly, in, in short, it means fewer people. It's, it's, a, it's a very devastating issue that we are discussing. Dr. Campbell, what would you say? There are a lot of critics of your, your point of view say that, look, there are probably unforeseen oil bases out there. We're finding uh, unconventional oil, be it tar sand in Canada or in Bakken. And also our technology is advancing. I mean, our deep sea drilling technology is going to the, uh, to the next level. We also have horizontal drilling. And what would you say to them? They're relying on the advancement of technology and potentially unforeseen reserves in the future. What, what are your points? What are, what are your views on those two issues? Well, you, 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 the criticism is to some degree justified because earlier assessments I made 10, 10, 10, 15 years ago were much lower than the ones I make today. So. Indeed, I have had to revise upwards the estimates that I've been making, because indeed surprises happen and we do fall into something new. But the generality of the picture is, is I think, now very clear, and I think it's very important to distinguish the different categories of oil. I recognize what I call regular conventional oil, that is delivered most to date and will dominate all supply far into the future. That's the most important. And I think that already peaked back in 2005. Okay, then we turn to the deep water, and there's no shortage of deep water around the world, but there's very few geological provinces in the deep water that have the necessary conditions to deliver. They're mainly in the Gulf of Mexico and flanking the South Atlantic for all sorts of well-known geological reasons. So I don't expect any huge significant discoveries to be made elsewhere in deep water. Of course, there's always the freak anomalous discovery somewhere, but nothing of really world significance. There's great interest now turns to the polar regions, and I would say that the, the geology of the polar regions is primarily a gas, a gas domain, and it, it, again, you can have the odd freak occurrence such as Puda Bay in Alaska, but generally speaking, it's not a very favorable domain. Now, it's early days to say that dogmatically, more exploration is needed to, to make sure, but that would be a reasonable assessment. So when you, and technology, of, I, no one disputes, there's been enormous technological advances to drill in five, uh, five, uh, 500 meters of water and to 5,000 meters of depth is, is an amazing achievement. And of course, there are the occasional accidents as a result. 
But I don't think the technology is, is really going to so solve the overriding situation. Sure, it can ameliorate the decline rate after peak, but it's not going to affect the general picture. Uh, it seems uh, to, to us that back in the 70s, when the United States did experience peak oil uh, here, and given the challenges of the mid-70s, the uh, resources of oil were denied to the United States because of the war that was in the Middle East taking place. It seemed that in late 70s, uh, with Dr. Schlesinger uh, really starting a new thought and President Carter in the office at that time, they were to go after green energy, whereby in 30 to 40 years, if today, which is today's day, they would be ready for it. There was a movement, but it died away. And, and can you, in your assessment, what happened back then? Obviously, there was level of awareness, but what happened that we did not follow up? I, I, I don't really know, I must say, but uh, I mean, sure, when, when the United States peaked in the 70s, then the government was aware of its peak. It, it was reluctant to, to find itself vulnerable to foreign control, and so there was a certain movement in the direction to find alternative energies and turn to nuclear and everything else. But uh, eventually, I think the sort of economic pressures of cheap oil over, overrode the political and, and, let's say, social assessments, and they said, well, so long as we can get the stuff relatively cheaply, let's, let's do it. And, you know, if we have to have a war in the Middle East to try and get some oil, well, that's what it takes. Mm. So there was that kind of shift of attitude, I would say. But I don't really know. Very short-term thinking, in other words. So in, in some of the uh, statesmen and politicians have been coming out and talking about it, including, again, Dr. James Schlesinger, which we interviewed some time ago, and he recently basically said peak oil debate is over. Uh, but we see a, a, a rest of the uh, politicians, for the most part, they're not really uh, talking about it. But we also saw last week IEA uh, chief, uh, Mr. Byrule, he said $100 oil prices would be serious risk to global recovery. Now, having se seen that, now I, I am right now illustrating the world discovery picked uh, a slide that you provided to me. Can you again capture the essence of this peak oil, especially for those that cannot distinguish between the exploration, finding of the oil, and actually extraction of the oil? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, you obviously have to find oil before you can produce it. And I think it's enormous credit to an Exxon executive, Harry Longwell, who back in 2002 published uh, something similar to the, uh, this graph showing that the peak of world discovery was in the 60s. And, of course, the peaks and troughs is not a straight line, but it has declined ever since. So, so we've been in decline of discovery for 50 years. And in 1981, we started using more oil than we found in new fields as we ate into the resources found in the past, and this gap has widened ever since. So it takes no great nuclear science to extrapolate that downward trend to show how much is left to find in the future. Of course, here we're talking mainly about the regular conventional oil and not taking into account these tar sands and the, 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 the gas, the new, the new, uh, new gas deposits in, in America and elsewhere. But I think the general picture is, is really underlined by this, this, this picture of peak and peak discovery in the 60s, delivering a corresponding peak of production uh, around 2005. Now, uh, many uh, of the scholars, and there are potentially predicting somewhere 2012, Dr. Hirsch recently mentioned that to 2015, a window where we really see the natural decline in the world production on the liquid side. And, uh, but there are less... Uh, less certainty about the natural gas. Would you share with us your assessments of when are we going to see a decline in oil production, liquid petroleum, 
and also natural gas. Well, as, as, as I say, the, 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 the peak of regular conventional oil, that's, that's what supplied most to date and dominates most production into the future. My best investment is it came around 2005. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to that, you can have the heavy oils from Canada and Venezuela and a few other places. They're slow to produce, they're expensive to produce, they're environmentally damaging. So I think the production will rise slowly, but it will only serve a little bit to ameliorate the, the decline. Then over above that, you have the deep water oil from a few places, the Gulf of Mexico, of Brazil, of, of Angola and Nigeria. And, and, and this is very hard. This is stretching technology to the limit. So I think you'll have a, a surge of production, a plateau, and then a decline. Then you have the polar regions. There's, I don't think that's going to deliver as much as some people hope but it's early days to be sure. Then you have gas, uh, and that has a rather different depletion profile. It, it doesn't have a peak. It has a plateau, rather. And my own best guess is that uh, the world production will peak around 215, 220, somewhere around there. So we've still a lot more gas to get. And then there's these unconventional gases from shale gases and so on, which are developing quickly, in the, in the, especially in the United States and moving around the world now. But they're expensive, the wells don't produce for very long, uh, they're difficult. It'll add a little bit, it'll ameliorate the decline, but it's not exactly a substitute. Now, given the, uh, the potential peak of natural gas in 2015 that you're describing, as you probably know, T. Boone Pekin, although he's a peak oil believer, but he is of the opinion that the United States has plenty of natural gas and he's advocating a, a change of, of platform change, essentially utilizing and changing our automobiles from using oil to essentially to, to, uh, to some of the maybe natural gas and so forth, and actually natural gas going and producing electricity. So actually banking on a, on a long-term supply of natural gas, would you agree with him? Uh, to, to a degree, it can, it can ameliorate the decline and it makes sense to to start to move to, to to something that is available. But I think it misses the fundamental point, which is even if that can add a few more years to, to the availability of these fuels, the main thrust of policy should be to use less, to be more efficient, to stop wastage, and all of those things is, is really the way to go. And by all means, if, if more efficient usage or turning... Hydrogen has been used as a, has been spoken of as a fuel and so on. By all means, let those things be done, but I think the impact will be to ameliorate the decline rather than allow growth to continue. Uh, Dr. Campbell, there is a fundamental question here that remains. We understood from your, from your discussion today, we totally understand that IEA's position is really to uh, not come out with their, the right numbers, if you will, because of their job. Now, it would be uh, very naive to think that they would not share that kind of sensitive data with our top-notch politicians, be it in Britain, be it in the United States. Um, now, I want to start with one angle. I understand that you have done some discussion with some member of the uh, House of Commons in, in, uh, in England or at some level, do you, have you done that? And a second, do you find that they get it? Well, I've had various meetings with politicians over the past few years. I've spoken in the House of Commons in, 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 in London to a particular committee. I've spoken in the Irish Parliament and to the EU even. And I think there is a growing awareness of what we're talking about. I, I, it's not regarded as sort of some idiot doomsday story. It's, it's taken seriously now, I think, everywhere. Now, the scale of the problem is, is open to debate. So there are many political pressures to sort of avoid the, the dire consequences that it delivers, which doesn't make, you know, that's not attractive for a politician, as we've already discussed. But I think behind closed doors, I mean, even a, month, a few weeks ago, I had a call from no less than the International Monetary Fund who said they'd been following my work for several years and had come to uh, agree with it. 
So, I mean, I think there is an awareness. For the moment, it's sort of behind closed doors because nobody really knows exactly how to react. But there is a sort of growing awareness, I would say. Now, with, with that, um, sort of secretive for a while, as you said, now we're seeing signs of more open discussions about this. But one fundamental question I have for you, sir, that in America, at least, we still do not see any kind of move toward less consumption as we kind of see in Europe there the G20 meetings we see the European Union going toward uh, austerity plans if you will in the United States were pushing consumer spending so that we could grow GDP the the problem we have with that if they know behind the scene more consumption of anything means more consumption of oil and yet oil as all various organizations are coming talking about it is going to be a challenge uh, down the road how long do you think this will continue and if we in the united states at least we push this being the most vulnerable of all countries what do you think the impact is going to be in the united states on the, but once the impending short, shortage of oil sits in well, I, I think the problem is that uh, we were, let's say, arriving out of the last century or so, we, we live in a financial world. The, the stock market, there's the banking, there's the debt, there are all of these things that are built on the mindset of economic growth, and, and there's a huge vested interest in every side that is built on, on let's say, the past. And it's extremely difficult for this this, these people who run things, really, to uh, face up to the reality that we're facing an onset of decline, a contraction. You know, the, the first half of the age of oil was one of expansion. The second half has to be one of contraction. And uh, this probably speaks of more localization, more, more uh, really fundamental changes in the way people live. Well, quite obviously, there are many, many vested interests all over the economy who prefers that not to happen because it's something new and entirely different and they may or may not be able to adapt to the new circumstances. So we are talking about a very difficult uh, issue that is very hard for the commercial world and the financial world and the political world, which really is, is, is part of the same thing, to, to face up to what's, what's beginning to open. But nature, I have to say, uh, lives its own life and it, it delivers what it does deliver. Uh, the, when we look at the two economies of the United States, the largest at the moment, and the fastest growing actually in the emerging market, which is the Chinese, do you think the Chinese have really grasped this peak oil and are there, are there strategic movements of uh, investing worldwide taken into place? Uh, what's, what's about to happen? I, I, I'm not a, an economist, I don't really know about such things, but my, my feeling is that both India and, and China have come to this sort of globalized market uh, five, five minutes to midnight, you could say, and I, I must say that both countries face enormous problems because their energy supply is limited, they have excessive populations, and if, if the kind of globalized economy that has suddenly delivered a great wealth to them diminishes in the face of what we're talking about, well, I think both countries face enormous problems. So, I, and I, I think for the very same reasons we find it in the West, it's difficult for them to, to really face up to it, although there are academic groups in China who are, who are part of this ASPO organization who are beginning to talk about the same thing. So uh, I, I think that you'll face, whether you look in China or, or the Western economies, and, and, and governments, there's a certain reluctance to face this thing head on, but a bit behind the scenes and behind closed doors, people are aware of what's beginning to happen. 